The Sixers have lost two of their past three games and have dropped in the Eastern Conference standings. The Phillies, though, have shown how electric their bats can be in spring training. And the Eagles have brought back the beloved Cali Green jerseys. All of that coming to you on Sports Talk Philadelphia. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Sports Talk Philadelphia. I'm your host for another episode, Cale Flieger, and I'm joined by my usual panel, uh, my co-producer, Aiden Sosinski. Aiden, how are we doing? Doing well, Caleb. And Matt Dorenzo back for another episode. Matt? I'm also doing well. well we're going to jump right into it. Uh, not so good news for the Sixers. Uh, last week when we talked last, uh, they were in first place in the Eastern Conference and everything was great. Well, now they've dropped to fourth place in the Eastern Conference and they've lost two of their past three games. Um, we are going to start with their first game. They did beat the Clippers 122-97. to Embiid, 27 points, Harden 29 points. Great game for the duo there. Um, they did lose to the first place team in the Western Conference, the Phoenix Suns, 114-104. to um, Embiid showed his MVP numbers, 37 points, 15 rebounds. Didn't get much help in that game, though. And then they lost to the Bucks at home, 118-116, to after blowing a 10-point lead late in the third quarter. Embiid, 29 points, 14 rebounds. Harden, another impressive game there, 32 points, 9 assists. Tobias Harris chipped in with 22 points. Um, we are going to start with the Clippers game. Um, just overall impressive win. Um, what did you guys see from that game? And obviously it was a great game. I mean, Embiid 27 points, Harden 29 points. That's what you need from your two top scorers. You yeah, know, absolutely. And this is something that the Sixers really haven't had until recently with both Harden and Embiid playing well together. Um, it's great to see that it's finally connecting, especially this late in the season. Um, they haven't had, they've only had about a month to work together. So it's really good to see that it's happening now. Um, and it's good that they got at least one win out of it so far. Yeah, I mean, even leading up to that game, all the talks were Harden and his bad shooting. I think he was like 1 for 10 the game before, like 1 for 17, he really struggling. But he really showed that he can be that guy on offense when Embiid's not in the game or when Embiid is having an off night. You see 29 points, 15 rebounds, 7 assists. 15 rebounds from your point guard shooting guard is really impressive considering you have Embiid also getting 10 points, uh, I mean 10 rebounds. Overall, it was a really good win with the duo, it shows what they can do. I know the Clippers aren't the best, one of the best teams in the league, but still, they're high compete uh, NBA team with the playoffs position, and I'm just really looking forward. If, if, if they can keep that up, then they're going to go pretty far in the playoffs. Yeah, sadly, after the good win against the Clippers, the Sixers did fall against the Phoenix Suns. In the first half of that Phoenix Suns game, the Sixers looked great. Tobias Harris is playing great uh, with the second unit, and then Doc Rivers took him out after they had a 15-point lead, and it went back to nothing. So um, Sixers ended up losing that game 114-104. to um, Embiid had a monster game, 37 points, 15 rebounds. Um, Devin Booker did outplay him, though. I'm pretty sure he had 42 points in that game. Um, what are your guys' overall thoughts in that game? I mean, personally, I think that was a game where they cannot lose. I mean, you're up 16 points in the first half. Um, that's just something that you just have to play well through the rest of the game and get that win. Yeah, overall, I think it comes down to we got outcoached. I mean, going up 16 points against one of the best teams in the league, you really have to play the cruise control position and play to win the game at that point. And other than Embiid, nobody really played in the second half. I know Tobias, like you said, had 20 and 10 in the first half, looked outstanding for the first time in a while. But it came down to coaching. And Doc Rivers clearly got out coached by the, uh, Monty Williams, and it was just can't have that if you want to win a championship. I would say out of the three games that happened in the last week and the two losses, this is definitely the most frustrating because we were playing so well against the top team in the West. This could be a potential finals matchup, something that a lot of Sixers fans thought would happen last year. So we really wanted this win. Again, to be up 16, you can't really blow that lead. And this is much more on Doc Rivers than the Bucks game. I'll get into that in a little bit. But I just feel like that you just got to coach, like match, you just got to coach to win the game. And that just did not happen. Yeah, definitely frustrating with Doc Rivers, especially when they were up and going on that run in the first half. Tobias Harris was going off. He had 20 points in the first half, and then uh, Doc Rivers just took him out in the first half while they're going on a run. I mean, when you, have a, uh, when you have a unit going on that type of run against a team like the Suns, you keep them in until it doesn't work no more. So Doc Rivers uh, definitely shot himself in the foot there, and I think it definitely played a huge role in the reason the Sixers lost that game against the Suns. Um, the Sixers did play the Bucks at home uh, a couple nights later and did lose that game again, 118 to 116. Um, a pretty crucial game for the Sixers as they were tied with the Bucks for the season uh, series split. Um, the Bucks did get that, so if standings come down to it, the Bucks do have an extra game over the Sixers for the regular season. So big news there. Um, over again, Sixers blowing a late uh, game lead, ten, ten points in the late third quarter. Um, Doc Rivers again took Joel and beat out for I think it was eight minutes and. Giannis had 15 points during that span, so 
my thing is when you're seeing Giannis going off like that, you have to put your MVP back in, another guy that can guard the paint because we can live with Giannis jump shots all day long. But when he's just going in there and getting easy dunks and buckets, I mean, Doc Rivers has to do something about that. Kelv, I'm going to respectfully disagree with you, and here's why. Yes, Doc Rivers did take Embiid out in a crucial part of the game. Yes, Giannis did go off and Embiid was off the court. Embiid played 39 minutes in a regular season game a week before the playoffs, or like two weeks before the playoffs. At this point, you've got to get in the mindset of keeping your guys healthy. I understand that this was a huge game for the Sixers to win. I understand that Embiid coming out definitely hurt the Sixers' chances of winning this game. But I just feel like you need Embiid to be healthy in order to win. And this was more of a management than trying to win the game. And at this point, I'm okay with it. If this is a playoffs, Doc Rivers should not have a job anymore. But at this point, I'm willing, as much as I've been critical of Doc Rivers, I'm willing to let this one slide. Yeah, I mean, up 10 at halftime, you really can't lose that game, especially with the Eastern Conference standings being that close. Like, that loss puts you in such a really hard position to come back in the standings. Uh, but as it is, Embiid, like, he's not going to play all 48 minutes in the playoffs. So we do really need somebody to step up. Harden was on the entire game, but late in the fourth quarter, he really kind of just disappeared. You saw that last shot. It wasn't even close. Embiid, they get, they get the rebound. I do want to say that was a great play by Giannis, the block. But overall, up by 10, must-win game. You can't blow those leaves at home. Yeah, I completely agree. Another thing, going back to that Bucks game that I did disagree with Doc Rivers, was uh, DeAndre Jordan playing again. Especially when we saw Paul Reed, the prior game against the Bucks, held Giannis shooting 4 for 13 and didn't get a single minute during that Bucks game. And I think it's really frustrating to see that, especially the way DeAndre Jordan is playing. He's giving no firepower to that offense at all. Um, when he came into that Bucks game, he had two offensive fouls right off the bat. I mean, he's just not giving the Sixers any valuable minutes. And I think, I don't know about you guys, but I think it's definitely time that Doc Rivers has to start giving Paul Reed some minutes. I mean, he's a great rebounder. He's young and he's athletic. I mean, what can you have to lose at this point? Yeah, I think with Paul Reed, the biggest issue that I have with him is it was one game against one of the top players in the league. I don't, I think it was more, I heard this on the radio, I kind of agree with it. It's more Giannis missing shots than Paul Reed shutting him down. Because no offense to Paul Reed, he's not Giannis. He's not going to shut down Giannis every single game. And Giannis would learn how to play against him. So I kind of don't think that that would have made a huge difference in the game. I mean, Paul Reed's definitely a young, energetic guy coming off the bench. But if we're going for a championship, we do need Giannis. We need Jordan to step up and get those minutes. Like, I understand he did shut down Giannis the game before, but going forward in the playoffs, you can't trust Paul Reed in those situations against Giannis and all the other bigs in the East. So realistically, I think Doc getting DeAndre Jordan more involved, I, I don't disagree with that. Yeah, overall, just not a good week for the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, hopefully to bounce back in that win column tonight against the Detroit Pistons. Um, we are going to move on. Uh, the NBA had an MVP straw poll. Um, they've been doing this out throughout the season. They had one about two months ago where in beating Jokic were exactly even with first place votes. Uh, one came out a few days ago, and Jokic now has 62 first-place votes, and Bede's got 29 first-place votes. Uh, betting odds for Embiid went from minus 250 to plus 125. Um, just overall, I think it's very frustrating for a 76ers fan to see this as the numbers that he's been putting up over this season are unbelievable. I mean, you got to look. Nuggets with Jokic on the floor, plus 2.5. Without, or plus 5.9. So they're, they're a better team without Jokic on the floor. Uh, the Sixers with Embiid on the floor, plus 6.9. Without, plus 0 0.8. So obviously, the difference Embiid has on this team is instrumentally better than Jokic. You know, I, I agree with that. I mean, the Nuggets were, what, the sixth team in the, in the West, and the Sixers are fighting. They were the one seed uh, a few days ago. So if Embiid keeps putting up his numbers and the Sixers get a top two seed in the East, I don't know how the voters can't vote for him. And it, honestly, it'd be so disrespectful towards Philly and the fans if Embiid doesn't win MVP here. Because I know Jokic won last year and everything, but Embiid's clearly outplaying him this year. Yeah, I definitely think that the biggest thing for the Sixers and what we're looking at right now is the fact that Harden – came when the Harden came with the Sixers that's when Embiid's rating went down it's as, almost as if the voters totally forgot that Embiid was basically playing by himself this entire year with no Ben Simmons and Tobias Harris really lacking so it is very frustrating for a Sixers fan to see the voters basically forgetting the past rest of the season just looking at the last month at least that's what it feels like to me yeah definitely a frustrating week to be a 76ers fans losing the past two out of three and then seeing this straw poll and seeing Embiid pretty much not even close to Jokic for the MVP race uh, pretty frustrating week to be a 76ers fan that's all we have for Sixers this, uh, this week. We are going to jump to Phillies. That They've been uh, pretty good news for the Phillies so far in spring training. Um, two of their young guys that they drafted in the first round, one first overall, Mickey Moniak and Bryson Stott, I mean, have just looked absolutely insane during spring training. I think no one really expected this. Um, Bryson Stott, nine for his last 12. Mickey Moniak has three home runs this, uh, this spring training. Bryson Stott's also batting 526 during spring training. Mickey Moniak, 333. 
Um, this is definitely the type of youth that the Phillies need, and I think this would be a great addition to the lineup to have two young guys like this um, to come up in the farm system because we've known the Phillies farm system has been really weak over the past few years when they've been struggling to make the playoffs. And having two guys that you drafted early in the first round finally starting to step up and show their potential for this lineup, I think it's great for the Phillies. You know, it definitely is. Uh, Mickey Moniak is the only guy left from any of the Philadelphia teams that drafted someone in the first round in 2016. Pretty surprising considering that that draft class for Philadelphia included Ben Simmons um, and a couple other really good players as well. Nolan Patrick was the other one. So we're really looking at it. I'm glad that he's stepping up. I think that he'll probably be on the bench because Matt Verling's playing really well and there's not really a spot for him in right or left field. But Bryson Scott is looking to take out Boehm Scott at third base, and that can be really interesting considering that the Phillies were really high on Boehm the last two years. So I'm interested to see who's going to maybe take third. Maybe he'll take Didi's spot too, although Didi's playing well as well. Um, so I really don't know which way the Phillies will go, but it's nice to have these options because that's something they haven't had in the recent past. Yeah, no, definitely. The Phillies' farm system has been atrocious the past decade since, since we've made the playoffs. Um, but Bryson Stott, man, it's, it's, a, it's a good sign seeing your a young player succeed. Um, he, I know he was heating up in spring training, but in that Orioles game the other day, he has an 0-2 count, fought a few pitches, and they hit a single the opposite way. And seeing that from your young player is beautiful. I was watching the game today. He had he was three for three again. And Mickey Milner, his swing just looks better. He looks more confident coming to the plate. He's hitting, he has three home runs so far in spring training. I couldn't tell you the last time I even heard him get a hit. <laughs> so, so right now, that's a really good sign going forth, Phillies. I'm not sure if they'll start right away. You might have, you might have to throw Bohm in and start third base, and then, as I just said, Matt Veerling. But going forward, having these guys in their farm system and on, and on their bench is really huge for the Phillies. Yeah, uh, one thing I saw that Phillies fans may disagree with is Bryson Stott, like we said, is getting reps at third base right now over Alec Bohm. Um, Bryson Stott did get drafted as a shortstop, and we saw earlier on with Scott Kingery, he was drafted as a second baseman. Phillies played him as kind of a utility player, third base, shortstop, outfield. Um, do you guys see that as a problem? Do you think that could actually hurt Bryson Stott, putting him at third base instead of his natural position at shortstop? Or do you think at this point he's just that type of player where he can actually make third base work? Um, well, we saw what happened with Scott Kingery. We, we threw him all around shortstop, third base, center field, left field, wherever, wherever we can find a, a position for him, and it really didn't work. So if you, I, Bryson Stott, he's a good enough infielder, good enough player, he's young enough where you can mold him in a third base position, because shortstop and third base is not too much of a difference. So as long as we keep him on, the, on that side of the infield, I think he'll be fine, and I really, I think he'll succeed either way. Yeah, I'm going to go off Matt's point a little bit there. Um, not to make too big of comparisons, don't read too much into this, but Alex Rodriguez was a shortstop most of his career, and then when he went to the Yankees, became a third baseman and still did really well defensively at third base. So it's not completely out there for the Phillies to move a shortstop as Bryson Scott to that third base position, especially if Bohm's struggling. Um, so I don't think it would be too big of a leap for them. And Larry Boa, actually, who's very uh, crucial about the Phillies, uh, had some kind words to say about him for this upcoming season. He said, I wouldn't be shocked if this team makes it to the World Series. Um, a, pretty much a big statement for a team that hasn't made the playoffs in 10 plus years. Um, Boa is his current senior advisor to GM for the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, overall, I, he, pretty much Boa said he loves the job that Dave Dombrowski has done this offseason, obviously adding Nick Castellanos, Kyle Schwarber, um, adding some bullpen pitching as well. Uh, beefing that up a little bit. Um, do you guys think this is the year where the Phillies break this 10-year playoff drought? I think they definitely break the drought. I don't know about a World Series. I'm hopeful for it, especially with the way that our hitters have been doing so far. Um, but I think that if anyone's going to know about winning a World Series, it could be Larry Bow, who played with one of the best, if not the best, Phillies teams, the 1980 World Series team. Um, he played with some great guys then. I think that especially he was also a manager for a little bit and struggles with some of the Phillies' bad times. So he's had a lot of experience with good and bad teams. The fact that he's making the statement at this point makes me feel very good about the Phillies. Yeah, I mean, they, they came so close last year to that wild card and even the division. So adding those two bats in Sh uh, Schwarber and Cassianos, re-signing key guys like uh, D.D. Gregorius, and even buff buffing the bullpen with Brad Hand and Corey Knable, and even Adam Familia. Those are cool, ex good, experienced guys who can come in in seventh and eighth and ninth inning and shut them out. I know they're getting older, and I know they're having not top names for agency, but I really think the Phillies did a lot better, a lot more than we thought they did just by signing those two bats. Yeah, we knew uh, signing those two bats would create a lot of home runs for the Phillies, and we already got a sneak peek at that as Castellanos and Kyle Schwarber hit their first home runs in spring training as a Philadelphia Philly. Um, Castellanos was a bomb to left field. Schwarber hit his to round center right field. Um, overall, it's just great to see that. I mean, uh, the last Philly squad to have four players hit 30 home runs was 2009 with uh, 
Ryan Howard, Jason Worth, Chase Utley, and Raul Ibanez. Um, I think the Phillies have a great chance to actually do that this year. And my four, I think, has a chance to do that is Bryce Harper, Kyle Schwarber, Nick Cassianos, and Reese Hoskins. I mean, those guys have shown that they can hit 30-plus home runs in a season. And uh, as long as they stay healthy, I mean, I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, no, I, other than Hoskins, I think it's really in, in the picture for Schwarber, Cassianos, and Harper. Hoskins, I watched like, the last few games you it's like five at-bats, five strikeouts. So if he stays healthy, there's a chance, but I really don't see us beating that 0-9 lineup. I will say, though, that um, JT Omerito, we also didn't really talk about, and he's mm-hmm. someone that could hit. I mean, it's not something that does a lot. Obviously, catchers aren't known for their power. But if anyone, any catcher in Major League Baseball could hit 30 home runs outside maybe his Monty Grandal, I would see JT Omerito being a possibility for it, especially playing in Philadelphia, which is known to be a really good hitter's park. So not to overhype this team, I could see potentially five guys hitting 30-plus home runs if – uh, Hoskins gets a little bit better, and Mimuto uh, lives up to his full potential. Yeah, we've definitely seen Hoskins' uh, streaks as his uh, career has gone by. I mean, he'll go on that streak of hitting 10 plus home runs in a matter of a couple games, and then he strikes out for two weeks straight. So, obviously, we need some consistency from Reese Hoskins, consistency from this lineup, and obviously, we need them to be healthy this entire season to uh, make the playoffs and have those World Series aspirations. Well, that's all we have for the Philadelphia Phillies, as we're going to move on to the Philadelphia Eagles, as they are currently in the offseason. Um, kind of exciting news came out this week as everyone has been calling back for the Kelly Green jerseys. Um, I've been hearing this for several years now. Um, Jeffrey Lurie finally came out and said the Eagles will be bringing back these jerseys during the 2023 season. Um, 2010 was the last time the Eagles had the Kelly Green uniforms. Um, we're bringing back some historic times. Randall Cunningham, Reggie White. Um, just over, It's exciting times to see that probably it has to be one of the slickest jerseys in the NFL. Yeah, especially not only that one, but they're saying they're going to do an all-black one, including a black helmet for the first time ever. Mm-hmm. I think if you only had those two uniforms and you got rid of the Midnight Green, those would be <laughs> the best uniforms in the NFL. But regardless, I'm so happy they're bringing out the Kelly Green. Uh, Randall Cunningham is probably my favorite Eagles quarterback of all time. Uh, no offense to Don McNabb, who I grew up rooting for. Um, but I'm just so excited to see these coming back. Um, and especially for younger fans who only get to see them in pictures and old videos, this will be great for them. You know, I think it'd be happy. That, that Kelly Green with that vintage, vintage Eagles logo, it's just awesome to see. I mean, they, I mean, the last time I saw it was probably Mike Vick and Deshaun Jackson. Mm-hmm. That was that was awesome to see that. That was my childhood right there. So them bringing back this this jersey as a as a vintage one and something they can wear often, it's going to be a great money in draw from the organization. I'm looking to buy a jersey myself, and I, I couldn't be happier they brought it. They finally brought it back. Yeah, completely agree. Once those uh, Kelly Green jerseys hit the market with the current players, uh, they're going to sell pretty fast. And uh, I might caught myself a Devontae Smith one. So looking forward to that when they come out. Um, we also have uh, kind of a free agency recap for the Eagles. They have been a little quiet this offseason. A um, couple fan people wanted to be a, do a little bit more, but they have done a decent amount of moves. They signed edge rusher Hassan Reddick, um, who's been the second leading sack leader the past two years. So a great edge rusher there. Um, re-signed Derek Barnett. Uh, a lot of people have their different opinions on that, but it's a two-year contract, um, a good value deal for the Eagles, around $7 million a year. Um, they did sign wide receiver Zach Paschal, who Nick Sirianni coached uh, at the Indianapolis Colts. Um, he's a good backup receiver. And then they signed linebacker Kazir White from the Los Angeles Chargers. Um, he was a decent linebacker. He's young and uh, can definitely give the Eagles some competition in that linebacker room, as we know they need. Um, overall, how would you guys just rank this Eagles offseason so far? Um, Obviously, Hassan Reddick was the best signing they had, um, but the other guys are kind of backup players. So what do you guys think of this offseason so far? If I want to grade it, I'm going to give like a B, a B plus. Nothing too, lack, like, I, I, nothing too like pointing out with the eyes, but Hassan Reddick, a great edge rusher. Zach Pascoe, a great second receiver, great third receiver. And Kazir White, really underrated contract we got him for, and he's a great coverage linebacker. I couldn't tell you the last time the Eagles actually had one. And Derek Barnett, I mean, he got flagged more times than I can count last year. But I was really upset about the whole thing, but I saw a comment, and it was, he's the one who recovered Tom Brady's fumbled the Super Bowl. So I guess, I mean, if, if you're looking at it that way, then I guess Derek Barnett's always welcome. But overall, I think the Eagles did so did go to free agency, and they're just really planning for those three draft picks in the draft. For all the criticism that Eagles fans and anyone that covers the Eagles in the media will give Howie Roseman credit for, 
It's definitely not going to be his drafting. It's the way that he handles free agency. Here's what he did really well this year. He did not overpay any single one of these free agents, especially the wide receivers. Most people were asking for Amari Cooper. Some people wanted Christian Kirk. Both of those guys got outrageous contracts that they definitely do not deserve, um, especially teams, and they're teams that aren't competing either. I mean, the Browns are paying Amari Cooper five years, $100 million for a team that made the playoffs once in the last, like, what, 20 years? Um, and then they had the Jaguars playing Christian Kirk, four years, $84 million. They were the worst team in the NFL last year. So Howie Roseman did a great job not pay, overpaying anyone. Um, the only one that might be considered overpaid is Hassan Riddick, three years, $45 million. But the Eagles needed an edge rusher. They needed someone that could also play a little bit of linebacker and blitz, which is something they haven't had the last couple of years. So I'm willing to overpay for the linebackers position because it's a position the Eagles haven't really put any money into. And the other two guys I'm okay with. They're just backup roles. But it's just how you're doing a great job waiting for the draft, and we'll see if we can take advantage of that. Yeah, Howie Roseman uh, specifically said the reason they didn't go out and just overspend, like they, ha they obviously have a lot of cap space, but the reason they didn't just go out and overspend is because they have all this draft capital. They want to give these rookies a chance to go out on the field and actually show their worth and if they can be a solid NFL player in the future. So I like the offseason so far for the Eagles. Um, we are going to move on to the draft. Uh, that's coming up in a couple weeks here. Um, the Eagles, they still have those three first-round picks. 15, 18, and 19th overall. They have a second round, third round pick, um, all the way through a sixth round pick. A lot of draft capital for the Eagles this year, um, and everyone's eyeing up those three first round picks. Um, where do you think the Eagles are going to go with this, uh, these draft positions? I personally, I think they're going to go two defense, one offense, definitely a wide receiver after they didn't uh, sign a veteran wide receiver in free agency. Um, definitely need the wide receiver position there. So you definitely see him going wide receiver and then definitely an edge rusher and a secondary guy there. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. I think that you have to go with wide receiver because that was the group that definitely lacked last year. Um, definitely someone, either cornerback or safety, some defensive back that can really help out there. And like you said, linebacker as well. Those are just the three biggest obvious needs that the Eagles had, um, considering that they filled a couple of the other ones this free agency. So I think those are the three things that we'll definitely look at in the first round. Yeah, you guys couldn't send any better. Linebacker, def uh, d defensive back, and then receiver. I mean, there are six receivers expected to go in the first round. I think the Eagles do grab one with the 19th pick. And hopefully they can just bring that defense uh, up a notch. Yeah, I know a lot of Eagles fans are itching for this NFL draft to come up. Uh, we'll see if the Eagles actually keep all three first-round draft picks, but definitely going to be an interesting uh, draft night for Eagles fans. Um, we are going to move on to Fast Five here. Um, our first one, uh, the same one every week, this week in college basketball with Aiden. So we're down in the Final Four. A lot of fans are definitely disappointed that St. Peter's did not make it into the Final Four, but there's so many great storylines this year. Um, obviously, you've got... North Carolina versus Duke, two of the best teams, one of the, the best rivalry in college basketball. Um, Coach K's last year versus against a team that beat him by 20 in his last home game. Um, then Duke ended up beating North Carolina in the um, Atlantic uh, ACC tournament. So it's going to be really cool to see them playing right now. It's unfortunate Roy Williams is still not the head coach of North Carolina because that would have been a great storyline. But regardless, that will be great. You've got Kansas versus Nova. They've not a couple of times in recent tournaments. It'll be great to see them competing. You've got three of the four power or three very powerful blue blood teams and then Villanova is also considered now a blue blood team considering that they've won two tournaments recently um three overall so again just so many great storylines I can't wait to see the final mm -hmm. um either way it's going to be a great end to the tournament yeah it's definitely going to be a really exciting Saturday for college basketball two great games coming up um going to probably gonna be two of the best of the tournament so far so definitely looking forward to this upcoming Saturday um next question we're going to go to I think everyone uh saw the Will Smith slap on Chris Rock in the Oscars. Um, I think it was a great move for uh, just overall. I mean, it, no one watches that show anymore. I mean, I don't think really anyone watches it. Um, after that happened, it blew up on social media. Everyone was talking about it. Everyone's still talking about it. It's almost been a week later. So I think overall it was a great move. Um, maybe not a great personality look for Will Smith, but at the same time, he did it. It happened. Chris Rock took it like a man. I mean, he laughed it off, kept doing his jokes. So I thought overall uh, created a lot of buzz around the community. and. You know, my peop more people might tune in next year and watch the show just because of that. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, the next question we're going to go to, uh, we'll go back to Aiden for this one. Out of the four final four teams we're talking about, Villanova, Kansas, North Carolina, and Duke, um, who has the best shot at winning it all? Yes, yeah, so it's definitely going to be really tough. All these teams have been playing really well. Um, I'm going to go with, I don't have one pick as of right now, but I think whoever wins that Duke-North Carolina game are going to win. 
Um, obviously, a lot of coach, a lot of the Duke game rides on Coach K. His players definitely want him to win that last championship. They have a lot of experience. I could see them winning. But North Carolina has really been on fire. No, they didn't win the ACC tournament, lost to Virginia Tech, but they were riding really high all the way through. I could see them winning this tournament, especially considering that they beat Duke to end their uh, last home game. So I feel like either one of those two teams, that's no offense to Kansas or Villanova, both of them are great. I just feel like the two teams out of the ACC are the best ones as of right now. Yeah, that Duke, uh, North Carolina game will be Coach K's 100th UNC versus Duke game. So definitely gonna be a great game. And it's gonna be one I think a lot of people watch and it's gonna definitely have great views for that game. So definitely looking forward to that. <clears throat> we are gonna go to Matt for this one. Malcolm Jenkins uh, retired after a great career. Um, one of the key pieces for the Eagles winning that Super Bowl. What's your reaction to that? I'm just happy for him. He has two Super Bowl rings on his. I was I, I read an article out there. I saw his retirement. He's he's one of the few players ever to beat both Tom Brady and Peyton Manning Super Bowl. Peyton Manning with the Saints and Tom Brady obviously with us. But I'm um, just really happy for him. I, I things didn't end the way we wanted to with him in Philadelphia. But he went back home to New Orleans where he started his career. And overall, just a great locker room guy, a great, a great guy you can count on to play as much snaps as you can. And I'm just over, overall happy for the next chapter in his career. Yeah, Malcolm Jenkins, um, besides on the play field that we all know he was great at in Philadelphia, all the off-field uh, stuff he did in the community for Philadelphia uh, definitely didn't go unnoticed. So Malcolm Jenkins uh, will definitely uh, go down as one of the best defense, uh, defensive players the Eagles have had. And definitely we'll see uh, him in the Eagles Hall of Fame someday. So. Great player and uh, overall great career for Malcolm Jenkins. Um, we are going to go to the last question here. The NFL uh, just approved a new overtime rule that the Eagles actually offer, uh, put out, um, but it was only for the postseason only. So as of now, when overtime hits, um, if one team gets the ball and they score a touchdown, the game's over. Other team, but if they kick a field goal, the other team gets a possession. In the postseason now, if that first team scores a touchdown, then the other team gets the ball to have a, try and score a touchdown. Um, I think it's great, especially for the postseason. I mean, I think the Buffalo Bills could have been Super Bowl champions this year if that was a rule this year. But what are your guys' reactions on that? You know, the Bills definitely would have wished that this rule was in place last year. Um, I like it. It feels close to the college football overtime. I personally really like the college football overtime. I want the NFL to put that into their game. Um, hopefully they will at some point, but at this point it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, definitely a step in the right direction. It's going to be a very interesting postseason, especially if it goes to overtime. That's all we have for Sports Talk Philadelphia today. I want to thank you guys for coming over and watching again. Don't forget to follow us on our social media pages on Twitter and Instagram at LaSalle LTV. Um, thanks for coming over and watching us again. We'll see you guys all next week again.